Well, hello, this is Jamie Silver with Herf Jones. Here is the next episode of the Yearbook Podcast, and boy, do I have some fun updates to share with you today, so I'm going to get right into it. Um, to start, a couple of reminders and updates. Um, I personally just got back from our annual Herf Jones meeting where I get to learn all about what's new, and I have a video to share uh, at the end of the podcast with that. But some of the things that I want to share with you that I learned is we we continue to update all of our sites, including eDesign, eBusiness, and tying it all into my hjyearbook.com that you're using now. One thing that I got to see a preview of that I want to share with you is the library changes coming to eDesign for next school year. So as you may know, many of you uh, have shared your thoughts with this, and I agree with you completely. When you look at the library and you look at previews of those images, they're a little small, aren't they? So the one of the examples they showed us, which is a live demo working uh, version of eDesign um, just in development, was um, a scalable library, meaning much like you might be familiar with you know, Google applications online or software on your computer, if you were to just picture that eDesign library and if you were to just grab part of that window and just scale it to the left and it would just stretch those previews as large as you want just on the fly really fluid, really helpful little addition. So you're going to see a bunch of those little things coming for next year. It's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, also, Square One, some of you are familiar with that. Some of you are not. If you would like more information, please let me know. But Square One, it's all about making it easier for you to create what looks like an award-winning book, and they are award-winning layouts and designs, but more importantly, helping you create books quickly that students want to buy. So it's going to come with a ton of new preloaded materials next year and templates. And uh, if you've worked with it, you're familiar with the separators and all those chunks that you drop in. If you're not, let me know, and I'd be happy to show you a live demo at school. But just know there is some really cool stuff coming to it for next school year. I got to see a preview. It's pretty great stuff. A couple other updates that are current and actually active right now. So one we just uh, rolled out maybe a week ago, you may have noticed, on the image editor within eDesign. Uh, uh, we had a cap at 17 megapixels as far as images you could bring in and work with the built-in tools to edit the photos. That is now raised to 42 megapixels. So, you know, as we all continue to roll with the time series technology changes, our phones, our cameras, they're all kicking out larger files, better files, resolution is higher. And as you might imagine, that, that puts more strain on any system as files get larger. And I just want you to know that we've raised that to 42 from 17 and all the stuff in the background to just scale with it as we all change with the times. Um, it's becoming more powerful as we go to work with those larger files. So just an FYI. Another thing that's um, happening in, in the eDesign library is when you upload images to the uploader, it will recognize the orientation. So if you took a, uh, you know, a landscape image, it will rotate it landscape and so on. Same with portrait mode. So if you take a portrait style photo, it's going to notice that and rotate it accordingly. Not that you can't rotate it as well, but it's going to try to rotate them as you upload them. So it skips steps for you later. Now, this next one is something I want to share with you that's in development. It is not done by any stretch, but it's something that you may have heard about. And I want to let you know that Herf Jones has put some resources into creating what we're going to call a hosted InDesign solution. We're calling it Ion. So for those of you listening, if you have a background in your book, you've been doing it for a while, you may be familiar with things like PageMaker and InDesign. Um, InDesign is a, a standard, right, in the industry of advertising, PR, printing, and all that. Um, and it's software that you buy from Adobe, you license from Adobe, and you install it on your computer and use it. And some of you listening do that. And there's a lot of updates to that as well, FYI, for those listening, as far as the um, enhancements and tools we provide that plug into the Creative Cloud. You'll continue to see that uh, change as InDesign Adobe changes InDesign next school year but what we've created is ION and you'll be hearing more about this but it stands for InDesign Online and it's in development and it's a costly project on our part it's something that Adobe charges us you know per student who's using it and so on but I just want to let you know it's something we know is a need for some schools most are, are pretty content with InDesign I'm sorry eDesign which is where majority of people are living these days and that's why we're been focused on that for so many years and you'll continue to see those improvements but for those of you interested we can talk more at school we will have a what's called a hosted solution meaning InDesign online so more to come if you're interested in that just let me know also I want to share with you save the date information for camp this summer uh, so my colleague uh, Maureen and Melissa put this out. Uh, the dates are June 19th and through the 21st. 
and uh, it'll be at Lake Forest Academy again. More information to come, but I wanted to get that uh, date out there so you can put it on your calendars and share that with students, uh, kind of coordinate, hopefully, this summer with summer trips and all that. So that's the date coming up for next school year. I'm sorry, this coming summer. Okay, now I mentioned I just got back from the meeting. I want to share this quick little video I put together. I just took some video on my phone here. I'm going to show this. It's about three minutes just to give you some insights of what's coming next year, some great ideas, brainstorming material for specifically covers for your yearbook. So I'll be back in about three minutes. Now, as I mentioned, I recently got back from our annual Herf Jones meeting. It's where I get to reconnect with all my great coworkers all over the U.S. You see this room full of true yearbook nerds here, yerds, and I'm proud to be one of them. And it's our opportunity to reconnect, but also get our hands on some books and see what people are doing all over the U.S. And I just shot a couple of videos on my phone here to bring back to you. Highlight some of our new materials. That's a new linen material and get your creative juices flowing for next school year. It's never too early. That's kind of a velvet touch cover. And I want to share some of these. This is a version of the cover. This book has three different versions of the cover. Think about that. You could do four each um, class in the school and maybe even put them in a sleeve, a box like this. Neat idea. This is an example of a plexi cover with a frosted finish. So as you reveal it slowly, you see what's revealed on the inside. A wood grain cover, another plexi cover with the end cut out or masked off with a cover material. And this is another one of those uh, frosted plexi covers. Cool addition and way to sh you know, highlight uh, what's inside. Neat corners on that book. Letters you could put on the book. All kinds of cool stuff. And I just want to share. That's a gilded edge, kind of like a Bible. It's painted on the edge with this really shiny material. Now, these, these are all cutouts and die cuts and laser cuts to reveal to show you what's inside. This is a neat one with the yellow to show through and then kind of a, a masked printing of the words on the front. A really cool torn end sheet that matches the picture there. This is more like a material to change. It's a different paper. It's a little bit metallic. You, you got to feel this. As you can see, my colleagues were all taking pictures. Um, if you're interested in that, I'll be happy to bring you some samples. Now these are mylar covers. So instead of paper, it's more of a mylar uh, material that we print on. It gives you that shiny look, almost like foil. Another cutout, and inside when you open it, you see a foldout. And I have several examples here I want to share with you because I just thought this was really cool. And uh, Betsy here is showing off some cool samples. This is actually a laser cut etched end sheet. And I have a sample of this. I'm happy to bring it to you at school if you want to see it. But uh, the ones coming up here are some really cool uses of foldouts. And again, here this one's on the front of this cover, on the front of the book on the inside. Kind of like a CD album artwork. Fold out, kind of like a menu, table of contents. This is a neat fold out right on the front end sheet, showing kind of timeline, if you will, uh, table of contents of the book. Now, you get a lot of cutouts in this book. You'll notice as Betsy shows the sample, right in the beginning here, you, hear, you see this like accordion like fold out showing all these. Um, you know, cut out backgrounds of these images. Really cool addition. It just keeps going and going. Really neat example. These are some notes in the back of the book. Kind of a neat way to add uh, some content to the back. So again, my, my, this is a flip book actually. As you cut through, you can, you can pick different versions. I just want to get your, your, your creative juices flowing. Um, love to chat with you soon. Bring you any samples like this or anything else you're considering. And uh, never too early to start planning for next year. So I, I hope you have found that helpful. It's the first time I've made a video of this event. It's one that I go to every year for the last 16 years with Herf Jones. And it's a fun way to, again, reconnect with my colleagues, but also brainstorm together and get some new ideas to bring back to you guys uh, for the next school year. So I figured I'd make a short little video, share it with you, maybe get the creative juices going, as I said, and um, just get you thinking about next school year as you're still working on this year's, obviously, but uh, just looking ahead. Now, with that said, that was kind of get you thinking about next year. I'm going to kind of rein it back now to this school year, and I have three quick demos I want to share uh, from my colleague Mark, who've seen some of his videos in the past, things that are more time sensitive to right now. So the first one is all about checking the pages to make sure things are getting ready and looking good and there's no errors for submitting it. So this is a quick demonstration. It's a couple minutes on the pre-flight check. So I'm going to bring that up here and uh, share this with you and I'll be back in a few minutes. In this tutorial, we'll look at how you run a pre-flight check on your pages. Pre-flight is a check that eDesign runs on the pages, examining them for several potential issues. 
A final preflight has to be run on the pages before submitting them, but you can launch preflight at any time during the production process. In fact, it can be a good practice to have each staff member preflight his or her own pages. They would do this before turning them over to the advisor. This will mean that the advisor will have fewer things to check or fix when preparing the pages for submission. To illustrate preflight, I'll jump over to this spread. To launch Preflight from within Page Design, go to the File menu and choose Run Preflight Check. I've created this spread to illustrate the types of items that Preflight checks. It would be very unusual for a single spread to have all of these problems. This spread was created specifically to show you examples of all the potential issues. eDesign has first notified us that the spread contains some invisible content. This refers to frames on the page that have no stroke color, no fill color, and no content, making them essentially invisible. These could be frames that were created on the spread but were never used. If I look at the spread in the background, I'll see that eDesign has selected the frame or frames that it is referring to. If you click Yes, eDesign will remove the invisible frames. The next item we'll look at is flagged on both the left hand and the right hand page, and that's text across the gutter. If I hover over the notification, the tooltip that pops up will give me a description of the problem. If I click on the notification, the item in question on the page will be selected. In this case, it is the headline text frame. I'll zoom in to 100%. You can see that the text frame is crossing the gutter. A text frame crossing the gutter is a potential problem because text that crosses the gutter could be partially obscured by the gutter when the book is printed and bound. I'll move the text frame slightly to the right so that it no longer crosses the gutter and the pre-flight warning goes away. I'll zoom back out. The next notification on the left-hand page is for image resolution. When I click to select the notification, the object on the page is selected. I'll zoom in again at 100%. This image is below the minimum resolution for optimal print quality. To resolve this, I'll double-click to enter picture manipulation mode. I'll scale the image down a bit until the resolution warning disappears. I'll zoom back out. The next notification on the left-hand page is for transparency. This flag points out an image that has transparency applied. When transparency is applied to an image, the image will not be color corrected at the plant since the color correction could affect how the transparency effect appears. This warning is here to let you know that the image with transparency will not be color corrected. If you intend the image to have transparency, you don't need to resolve this issue. If you did not intend for the image to have transparency, you can go to the Effects menu and set it to None. The next notification on the right hand side is a picture box warning. I'll click the notification to select the item in question and I'll zoom in to 100%. The picture box notification appears when an image does not fully fill the frame. As you can see, when I deselect it, this image is not filling the frame and I would have this empty area in the frame if I left it as is. I'll enter picture manipulation mode and scale the image up a bit so it will fill the frame. I'll zoom back out. The next notification is for an embedded image. This notification points out to you any images that are not in the JPEG format that will not be color corrected. In this case, it refers to an image that was cut out in Photoshop and saved as a ping file with a transparent background. This is correct and does not need to be resolved. Preflight is just letting me know that this image will not be color corrected. The next two items are bleed object warnings. This notification points out to you objects on the page that do not fully bleed off the page. I'll click the first notification to select the object on the page. I'll zoom in to see the object more clearly. In this case, the object is this graphic that extends into the bleed area but does not fully bleed off the page. I could resolve this by moving the graphic out a bit, but in this case I don't care if the graphic bleeds off fully or not. Given the pattern of elements, it's fine where it is, so I'm going to leave it as is. I'll scroll down a bit and click on the next bleed object notification. It refers to this red bar that does not fully extend out to the outside of the bleed zone. I do want to make sure that this red bar fully bleeds, so I'll extend it out to the outside of the red bleed line. I've now examined all of the flagged items and resolved the ones that are problems. I'll click Exit Preflight to return to page design.
And that's how you use the pre-flight check function in eDesign. Boy, that's a lot. And, and for those of you who have been working with eDesign, you you may have seen those. If not, I encourage you, as Mark said, to run pre-flight as you go rather than leaving it till the end. And as you saw, the one thing I noticed in the video I want to just highlight is you saw Mark click on the warning, you know, down the left or right side, for, depending on the right or left page. And I think some of us forget that sometimes because I often get a phone call of, you know, it's telling me there's a bleed issue, but I don't know where it is. So I just want to show that to you in, in Mark's video, because if you click on the word bleed on the, you know, that column down the right or left side, it highlights for you and draws your attention right to it and selects it for you so you can see what it's talking about. So, but again, in review, you know, the pre-flight is going to check things. It's not going to say that it has to be fixed. His example there with the transparency and the graphic that was bleeding off the edge, you know, it's not saying that it's a problem. It's just double checking and it wants you to review it to make sure. Some of those things are completely fine or intentional um, and you can ignore them as Mark said, but the DPI warning, we're going to get into that. That's the last video I'm going to share today. Uh, it definitely is something we got to look at. So, okay, moving on. The next one is also on the topic of something to consider doing now <laughs> rather than later. When I was on yearbook as a student, I can still hear my yearbook rep uh, saying this today. And uh, this is before we had easy tools like this. And he told me, you know, you want to start your index early and don't leave it for a big daunting task at the end of the school year. Of course I did. <laughs> so please learn from my mistake. And you want to get your index started really now, really any time throughout the school year. It's a, it's a fluid process. I mean, you don't have to start it and finish it at the same time. I would encourage you to start this process you're going to see in this video. I would encourage you to start this as you finish pages, right? And maybe even before you go to approve them for your advisor to submit them, because through the process of evaluating you know, entries for the index, you might find a typo. And what a great opportunity to fix that before you submit the page. So I'm going to show this quick video. Again, it's a couple minutes here, and it's going to talk about the index builder. I encourage you all to start using this now. It's cumulative and just work on it as you go. Okay, I'll be back in a few minutes. The index builder wizard makes it easy to build and flow a complete and accurate index in five steps. Step one, names. The hardest part is done for you as index builder automatically catches anything it thinks you'd want to include in your index, which means the work becomes an editing task, not a sorting through every page searching for names task. Once it creates the list of entries for review, you edit the list to make any desired changes, merging any duplicate entries, or specifying anything you don't want indexed. Step 2. Index Setup Simply choose where the index should start in your book, how many columns you'd like, and column spacing options. Step 3. Text Determine which font to use for the header and how you want it aligned, and choose or create a character style for the index entries. Step 4. Layout Review each page preview, adjusting column heights as necessary, leaving room for any other elements on your index pages. Step 5. Flow. Let Index Builder do its magic, creating the index pages and updating the latter. The Index Builder makes it easy for you to accomplish a key yearbook task, generating an accurate index of the people, groups, and topics in your book. Even if you don't print an index in your book, you may find the Index Builder tool useful. You don't have to wait until the end of the year to start working on your index. In fact, you can run the Index Builder as often as you wish throughout the year, editing entries and reflowing the index as many times as needed. Each time you run Index Builder, it updates the information based on the current state of your book, remembering all of your previous edits to index entries. It even applies your past edits to any new names found since the last time you generated an index. For detailed directions and tips on each of these steps, check out the rest of the Index Builder videos. Now, for those of you listening, <laughs> that wasn't Mark. That was my uh, colleague Adam giving that demonstration on the Index Builder. As he said, though, it's a great thing to start early. Okay, for the last video demo today, it is all about DPI warning and resolution. So I'm going to share this video. It's probably old hat, but I just want to go through it because it's a common thing. We're all dealing with this time of year. And, you know, because we're getting pictures from various locations, different phones, how old they are, you know, makes it a better or worse file, depending on the camera. So anyway, the warning that you may have seen, that big DPI triangle you saw in the first video in the pre-flight check, just want to explain a little bit more. This is a short one. It's only about a minute, and I'll be right back. Digital images are made up of small squares of color called pixels. 
The number of pixels in an image determines how large it can be printed and still retain the highest quality. As you scale an image up to print at a larger size, the pixels have to get larger to fill the space. At some point, the individual pixels themselves start to be visible and the quality of the printed image will get worse. One of the safeguards built into eDesign is a warning for low-resolution images. The warning lets you know when an image will not look its best when printed at the size you've set. As you make an image larger, at some point you'll see the DPI warning, which appears as a large caution symbol on the image. If you receive this warning, you'll need to scale the image down until the warning disappears, or you'll need to use the image in a smaller frame somewhere else on the page. You should not ignore the DPI warning as it indicates that the image will not look its best when printed in your yearbook at that size. Excellent. So again, those are great reminders of things to look for resolution. Well, I hope in recap that you found this information helpful, helpful, some reminders and updates both for the end of this school year and great things to come for next school year. That video of the covers and things we saw at our meeting, I want to share with you to get you thinking about cover ideas for next year. And um, of course, these demonstrations on things to be working on now, including the pre-flight check index builder, and of course, the DPI warning. So I hope you have a wonderful day. Happy uh, Valentine's Day in advance. It's February. And um, as always, you know where to reach me, but please feel free to reach out anytime I can be of service. Feel free to email, call, text, whatever you like. Uh, myself and my Herf Jones team with us here, we're ready to help. Have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.